and amen. All right, church family, take those home if you would and uh, pray with, uh, pray over the names there if you would, wouldn't mind there. All right, take your Bibles tonight. We are going to be in the book of Isaiah chapter number 21. The book of Isaiah chapter 21 is where we are at and uh, looking forward uh, <clears throat> looking forward to preaching this message and um, also I'm excited for you to hear Brother Young. I'm excited for you to hear him. So, well, I'm excited. I don't know if you're excited, but I'm excited. Isaiah 21, let's all stand if you're physically able. Out of honor and respect for reading God's word, Isaiah 21, uh, verse number 11 is where we're at. Isaiah 21, verse 11. The burden of Duma, he calleth to me out of Seir, watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, The morning cometh, and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye, return, come. The burden upon Arabia, and the forest in Arabia, shall ye lodge, O ye traveling companies of Dedanim. The inhabitants of the land of Tema brought water to, to him that was thirsty. They prevented with their bread him that fled. For they fled from the swords, from the drawn sword, and from the bent bow, from the grievousness of war. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Within a year, according to the years of an hireling, all the glory of Kedar shall fail. And the residue of the number of archers, the mighty men of the children of Kedar, shall be diminished. And the Lord God of Israel hath spoken it. Tonight, uh, the message, the title of the message is this, A Brief Window to Escape a Worse Judgment. A Brief Window to Escape a Worse Judgment. And then, well, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the message tonight. Father, we thank you once again. Lord, now is the time, dear God, of our services that, Lord, we, we sit down and we glean from your word. And Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord, uh, to do just that. Holy Spirit, I need you. And Father, I dare not try to rely on myself to do what you called me to do. Lord, I pray that you would work in a great way, Father, in the lives and your people. And Lord, that we might leave here with a greater desire to serve you, to love you, to take the gospel to people. Lord, I pray that you'd work in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> Has there ever been a time in your life that you look back on and you wish you did something that you didn't? You might be regretting something. There may, there, there, like right now, probably off the top of your head, it might be a little difficult for you to think of things. But there might be a, maybe a job opportunity that you wish you could have capitalized on, you could have jumped on. Or, or how about this? Was there ever a time that you wish you to serve the Lord when you didn't? Is there ever a time when you saw that there was an opportunity to serve the Lord and, and you thought, boy, I, 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 I want to, but I just don't know if, if I should. But then all of a sudden that window closes and then hindsight, you're looking back and you kind of wonder, I wonder what God could have done. I wonder what the Lord could have done. I wonder what the Lord could have done in my life. I wonder what the Lord could have done in somebody else's life if I had just kind of stepped out by faith and just did what God wanted me to do. You, you know, he, this is the thing, church. In life, there's no do-overs. In life, there's, there's only one shot to live your life. How many of you are familiar with the name of Ronald Wayne? Ronald Wayne. Ronald Wayne. Okay, I think only one uh, is familiar with the name of Ronald Wayne. And of course, Ronald Wayne's not exactly a very famous person, but he is known for something. And uh, Ronald Wayne, back in 1976, he had owned 10% of a company and the company was named Apple. Now, we know the name of Apple, don't we? iPhone. Some of you are like, oh, Apple. Okay. <laughs> he, he owned 10% of Apple. He had owned 10% of that. And the owners back then, of course, one of them being Steve Jobs, and the other, the other name escapes me. I forgot to write his name down. Uh, but they were in their early 20s, and Ronald Wayne was older. And, and so he couldn't really keep up with the, the, the energy and the strength that these young entrepreneurs had at the time. 
And honestly, Ronald Wayne, he was nervous and he was scared because these young men, they were inexperienced. They didn't really know a, a lot of the corporate business mindset. And these younger uh, entrepreneurs, they, had a, they took out a loan for $15,000. And they were also acquiring more debt. And so Ronald Wayne, uh, being the older gentleman that he was, thinking that he was making a wise decision, thought, if, if I stick around, that debt's going to fall on me. And I don't want to pay thousands of dollars in the debt. And neither would we. Right? Neither would we want to pay thousands of dollars in debt when there's young guys, young whippersnappers who don't really know much about owning a business. We would think the same thing. I need out. And so what he did is that he sold 10% of Apple for $800. Yeah, you know where I'm going with this. Today, 10% of Apple is more than $95 billion. No do-overs. $95 billion. Yeah. I say all that to say that there is no do-overs in life. You know, we look back and we say, boy, I, he looks back and says, boy, I wish I'd have stuck around. I wish I'd have done something else. But, but listen, the most important thing in life is not investing in Apple. The most important thing in life that you cannot afford to miss out on is putting your faith in the Lord Jesus. That's the most important thing that a person cannot miss out on. Now, here we are in the book of Isaiah. And in Isaiah, we've been discussing the invasion of the, the Assyrian army and how that the Assyrian army has taken over other nations, the northern kingdom of Israel, Moab, and, and the Philistia, and just other nations around there. And, and now what we have here is that we see the people of Edom, and they are seeking relief as well from the Assyrian army, the people of Edom, the Edomites. And, and we'll talk about them here shortly. Now, look at verse 11. The Bible says, the burden of Duma. He calleth to me out of seer, watchman. What of the night, watchman? What of the night? Now, you might be thinking, Pastor, you just said you were talking about Edom is seeking relief from the Assyrian army. But the Bible says here, Duma. Well, what, I don't understand. Well, Duma was another name for the, the kingdom of Edom in the mountainous regions of Seir. Okay? And Duma... It, that word, that Hebrew word, means silent. And it's where we get the English word. Now, I'm not trying to be silly. I'm not trying to be crude. Dumb. Dumb. That's where we get the English word. And, of course, the word dumb means not able to speak. That's just the definition of dumb. And so what Isaiah is saying here is that when he's writing this, he's referencing that there's going to come a judgment on Edom. And this judgment will cause Edom to be silent. So that's why he calls them Duma. It'll cause them to be quiet. In other words, they'll be destroyed. There'll be no more this judgment that's going to come upon them. But who were the Edomites? Well, the Edomites, they were the descendants of Esau. You know who Esau is? Esau, Jacob and Esau. When uh, Esau, he, I mean, basically, he has got the nickname of being red. And uh, when he was born, he was uh, a hairy red baby. He's like the first redneck. So he was. The Edom, the, uh, the land of Edom was a rugged land with red sandstone. The land of Edom was. And also the Edomites, they were a people who were bitterly hostile to the people of God. They, they were the enemies of God. So, so let's just kind of get this in our minds here, who the Edomites are. They come from a rough, rugged, enemy of God type of people. That, that's who they are here. And here's the thing. With, when the Assyrian army was making its way into Moab. Now, now I understand I'm giving names of places that we probably might not know off the top of our heads. But if you can just imagine with me. Here is Moab. And here is Edom. The, uh, the, Edom borders Moab. And, and so when the Assyrians came from the north and infiltrated the Moabites. They just didn't stop at the border. No, no, no. When you're going to conquer land, you want to conquer as much as you can. And so they started making their way into the land of Edom. And so here, the Edomites, they are being overwhelmed by the Assyrians as well. 
So you know what the enemies of God do? You know what these rough, rugged people do who are known for being the enemies of God? They turn to the man of God. That's who they do. That's what they do. Look at verse number one. It says, He calleth unto me out of seer, watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? Isaiah, he's referring himself as to being a watchman. Now, we know what a watchman is, don't we? A watchman is the person who stands up in the tower, and they're able to see out, to see if there's any enemy coming, see if there's any relief on its way. And, and so here are the, the people of Edom, and they're asking Isaiah, what of the night? What of the night? They say it twice. You know, when, when, it, when they say it twice, you know it's urgent. So why, what does that mean, what of the night? Basically, what they're saying is this. Is the night almost over? That, that's basically what they're asking there. Okay, now, now listen. We're going to do a little bit of a, a figurative spe- uh, symbolism here. I guess we can call it that. When the Assyrians invaded Edom, it was darkness. It was a dark time for them. And so when you have the Edomites, they're going to the man of God and they're saying this, what of the night? What of the night? They're simply asking this, is there going to be any relief from the Assyrian army soon? Uh, Do you see any daylight soon, man of God? Do you see any relief from the Assyrian army? What do you see, man of God? Uh, Listen, They thought that the man of God could give them some insight in their struggles that they were going through. Listen, this isn't part of the message, but I I think we can find some application here. Listen, this is why it's so important, Christian, that you have a walk with God. This is why it is so vitally important that you have a relationship with the Lord. Listen, you need to have such a close walk with the Lord because people who don't, when they go through troubles, they need somebody to talk to. They need somebody to, 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 to go to. They need somebody to counsel from. Here are the Edomites, the hostile people know, who come from uh, the, the, the Red Sands, who are the enemies of God. They found themselves in a situation that was beyond their control, but they knew to go to a man whose God was in complete control. Hey, listen, there might be some people in your life right now, and you, you would say this about them. They're hostile. There might be some people in your life right now that you know their opinion about you. They, you know their opinion about your faith. You know their opinion about your testimony. But, but listen, but when the world and life and challenges come their way, listen, you need to have such a close walk with God that they can go to you because they know you have God's ear. That's why it's so important that we have a walk with God. Now, listen, if you have a serious walk with God, listen, th- this is the thing. You won't even have to tell people you have a walk with God. If you have, if you have a real walk with God. No, no, listen, I'm not saying that excuses us from being a witness, okay? No, no, no. We, we need to tell people about Jesus. We need to invite people to church. We need to have a testimony about that. And we need to be bold with our faith in that regard. But, but, but listen, if we're real Christians, then listen, our actions should be speaking for us. It should. So here are the people of Edom. They're, they're going to the man of God and, and, and they're going to him. They're basically asking, will we ever be delivered? Do you see light anywhere, man of God? Do you see any relief from the Assyrian army? Now notice what Isaiah says. Isaiah reveals that there's going to be a window of opportunity for relief. Verse number 12. The watchman said, the morning cometh and also the night. Here's the man of God, the prophet. He says, morning's coming. There's going to be daylight. There's going to be some relief from the Assyrian army. Right now, now now, let me have your attention here. Look up here. Right now, you're in the Assyrian army. You're feeling the struggles of the Assyrian army. And it's a dark time for you. But listen, the light cometh. There's a window of opportunity. There's a window of relief. The light cometh. But then he goes on to say this. And also the night. Also the night. Right now you're in darkness over here with the Assyrian army. He says, I do see some relief. I do see some light. But after the light, after this light, there's darkness. Now what does he mean by that? What he means by that is this. The Assyrian army's here. You're in darkness now. 
there will be relief. But what's this other darkness referring to? Well, if you read earlier in the chapter, what he's referring to is this, the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonians. And, and, and so the people, the, the, the Edomites might be thinking this. Well, if, the, if this was bad, if the Assyrians were bad, how in the world are we going to handle the Babylonian Empire? This empire was difficult. This empire was strong. This empire was mighty. But there's going to be some time of relief right now. But now there's going to be another empire, a Babylonian empire, a greater empire, more difficult, more judgment, more darkness. So this is what Isaiah does. What Isaiah does is that he gives an invitation. Kind of like how we have invitations. Hey, hey just, just real quick. An invitation is not just a heads up saying that the preaching's done and we're about to go home. Right. That, that's not the purpose of an invitation. The purpose of an invitation is this, for you to make a decision on how God spoke to you. That's the purpose of an invitation. It's just not some ritualistic thing that we as Baptists do, that we stand up and then some people come forward, some people stay in the, stay in the pew. No, 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 no. The invitation is probably one of the most serious parts of the entire service. Yes. It, it really is. Uh, and, and church, uh, so here is Isaiah, and he's giving them an invitation. He's giving them an opportunity to make a choice. He's giving them an opportunity to make a decision. All right. Well, how does he do that? Well, look at your Bibles, verse number 12. The watchman said, the morning cometh, and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye, return, come. All right, listen, his invitation consists of three words. Inquire, return, and come. That's his invitation. Now, what does inquire mean? It means this, to seek out. It means to search. Well, search for what? Well, if the man of God is telling the enemies of God that if they desire to be relieved from the darkness to come, the judgment to come, that would be the Babylonians, then they should seek for the one who can only deliver them from that judgment. Who is that? God. So here is Isaiah. And he's telling them, inquire. Inquire what? Well, obviously, inquire God. Okay, listen. He's saying, you're in darkness right now. You have a small window of opportunity to avoid this coming darkness. You have a small window of opportunity to avoid a worse judgment, a worse darkness. And that window of opportunity, this is what you must do. Seek God. Seek God. Don't go seeking for help from other nations. Seek God. Listen, if they're going to seek God, then it's going to require humility. If they're going to seek God, it's going to require humility. If they're going to seek God, it's going to require complete dependence upon him. That's what it's going to require. If they're going to seek God, it's going to require reverence towards him. And then he tells them this. After you're done seeking, he says, return. Return? What does return mean? It means exactly what it means. Turn around. You know what word comes to mind when we say turn around? Repent. Repent. Turn around. Uh, Edomites, right now you're in darkness, but you have a window of opportunity. You have some daylight. And in this daylight that you're given, this is what you need to do. You need to seek God and you need to return. You need to repent. Hey, listen, here's the thing. When a person is very, very serious about seeking God, they'll find him. Listen, we don't serve a God who says, you need to try and find me. I'm hiding. No, 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 no. Our God is a God who reveals himself. He reveals who he is through creation, church. Come on now. He, his fingerprints are everywhere. I mean, the, the, the fact that you're, your heart is beating right now and your, the health that you have right now is evidence of his good grace. Come on now. It, it really is. And so he, here is Isaiah, and he's telling him, once you seek God and you found him, this is the thing. You're going to realize on how holy he is and how sinful we are. That's why he says, return. That's why he says, repent. You can't go to God in your condition. You can't go to God in your sinful nature. You can't. So he says, repent. And then he says, come. Come. Seek him. Repent. And come. What, what, what does that mean? Come. Follow God. Follow God. 
Listen, aren't you thankful that God is a God who receives backsliders? We should be. I'm thankful that he forgives backsliders. Listen, he, he loves those who come to him sincerely, uh, who come to him with, humi- with humility. They come to him in brokenness. And Isaiah is letting the Edomites know, listen, you have an opportunity. You have a window of light. And listen, this is what you need to do during that window of light. You need to seek. You need to return. You need to come. You need to pursue God. Because if you don't, there's going to be a greater judgment to come. Listen, the Edomites should take advantage of the opportunity to seek, turn, and come to God. Because if they don't, they will face an unstoppable judgment that will come their way. Listen, Isaiah, in verses 13 through 17, he speaks of other tribes that were part of the Arabian desert. And those other tribes, uh, they will be tribes that would undergo the Babylonian uh, invasion. Now, he speaks of the Arabian people of, uh, of Dedan. That would, and that they would be forced to lodge in the forest. Verse number 13 speaks about that. And... and, and I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail there, but uh, the, oh, where is it? The burden of Arabia in the forest of Arabia shall ye lodge, O ye traveling companies of uh, Dedanim. That's who they are, the Dedanims. Now, here's the thing. When the Babylonians would come and invade these Dedanims, the Bible tells us that they're going to be forced to lodge in the forest. Now, when we think of the forest, we think of Thick trees and luscious green grass and and pine and those types of things. But we need to remember where they're at in the world. We're talking about the Arabian desert here. And so when we think of forest, we think thick bush, think massive trees. But that's not the case here. This would have been more so just brush. But the idea is, is that when the Babylonians come, they're going to flee. They're going to run. And then in verse number 15, it says... For they fled from the swords, from the drawn sword, from the bent bow, from the grievousness of war. And it also talks about how they're going to rely on another tribe by the name of Tima. And that they would bring them food and water. And listen, they can run for so long. And they can hide for so long. But the fact of the matter is, in verse 16, the Bible says, For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Within a year, according to the years of an hireling, all the glory of Kedar shall fail. Kedar was the name of the northern region of Arabia where some of these tribes would live. So basically, this is what I'm getting at here. These tribes are going to try and run. They're going to try and flee. They're going to try to do whatever they can to try to escape this judgment. But the fact of the matter is, they will face this judgment. Why? Because the Lord of hosts said so. That was it. They can only do so, so much for so long. And the Lord of hosts said, within a year, within a year... They'll be gone. The inhabitants of Arabia and Kedar, they'll be going to face a judgment known as the Babylonian Empire, and there was no escaping it. Okay, now, now let's listen here. Remember, Isaiah was speaking to the Edomites in verse 11. Now, I know I've given you a bunch of different names, a bunch of different tribes here, but please try and follow along. They were speaking to the Edomites in verse number 11, then, verse number 11 and he was telling them, Take advantage of the time given to you. Take advantage of the window that you have that you're out of darkness. Seek God. Return to God. Come to God. Take advantage of those things. Repent. Follow him so that you avoid a greater darkness known as the Babylonian Empire. Notice what's going to happen to all these other tribes. They're going to try and run. They're going to try and hide. But there's no escaping it. So the idea is, Edomites, you have a chance. Take advantage of the chance. Okay. History tells us. History tells us this. The Edomites did not seek God. History tells us the Edomites did not return to God. History tells us that the Edomites did not come to God. You know why? Because they're not here. Listen. History tells us the Babylonian Empire came, took over the Edomites. Then after the Babylonian Empire came, it was the, the, the Medes and the Persians. They came and they took over. Then after it was the Medes and the Persians, then it was the Roman Empire that took over. 
And then after the Roman Empire, now listen, it was about 70 A.D. where Edom vanished off the scene. They're not here. Listen, here's the thing. God gave them a window. God gave them a chance. Seek. Return. Come. God gave them that window of opportunity. And because they didn't, because they didn't take advantage of that window of opportunity, that window closed, and the judgment came upon them, and they're not here today. Hey, listen, I, I, now I know I'm going a little bit late here, but please bear with me. Listen, there are people today that are completely unaware that there is an even greater judgment coming their way. There's a, there are people that are completely unaware that there is a judgment coming their way. And listen, here's the thing. People need to take advantage of the time that God had given them. Because if they don't, they will face an, listen, an unstoppable and eternal judgment. But listen, God has given each and every one of us a window of opportunity. He's given each and every one of us a chance, a window of opportunity Listen, for the believer, listen, for the believer, it's very, very, well, well, it's a blessing for us that what we face in this world in regards to judgment, this is the worst it gets for us. This is the worst. What we face in this world is the worst that it gets. Why? Because we know the Lord Jesus. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you know the Lord Jesus. And, and listen, we live in a dark world. We certainly do. I mean, we live in a corrupt culture. We certainly do. We live in a world where sin is the prince and the power of the air of it. Uh, it doesn't take long. and it doesn't, it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to just look at society, look at our culture, look at our country, look at the big cities, and you see Satan's fingerprints all over the place. We certainly do. So listen, we as Christians, we are in a dark time. But listen, this is as dark as it gets for us. But listen, for the unbeliever, for the unbeliever, this is the best it gets. This is the best that it gets. Praise God, we have the word of God. And praise God, we have the spirit of God. Listen, we have the word of God that's a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. And we can navigate in this dark world. And praise God, we have the spirit of God who's able to assist and guide and lead and direct us in our lives. Help us with our families. Help us with our children. Help us with, uh, with our marriage. Well, praise God, we have those valuable assets. Right. We have that. But, but listen, lost people, when they live in the world, listen, this dark world can beat them up. This lost world, th this dark world can beat up a lost person. So much so that they might say something along these lines. Is the light going to come? Is the light going to come? Is there any relief from this world? Or is this as good as it's going to get? Will there ever be relief from this pain for a lost person? The answer is this. No. No. In fact, for a lost person, this is as good as it gets. Because after this darkness, there's eternal darkness. You think this is bad. You think the living in this world is bad. Listen, it is bad. But listen, it doesn't compare to the coming judgment. It doesn't compare to what happens next. It doesn't compare. Uh, listen, there are people who are hurting all over the world today. Listen, there are people in Sterling, Colorado today who are hurting. Through emotional abuse. Through physical abuse. Through... Self-inflicting abuse. I want to be careful because there's little ears here. Sexual abuse. Abuse in the home. Where a husband is abusive towards his wife. And vice versa even. That takes place all over the world. And listen, there are lost people. And they think this. Who, who grow up in, in, in that type of lifestyle. And they think, is this all that life is? And this is the thing. They welcome death. They welcome it. And they think this. It cannot be any worse. Than the life that I am living now. 
It cannot be any worse. And listen, they think that if they take their own lives, they think that they are acquiring peace. But no, 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 no. Listen, if they don't know Jesus, they're not stepping into, from, from a dark place into, uh, into peace. No, they're stepping from a dark place into an eternal dark place. That's what they're doing. But praise God, he gave a window of opportunity. Praise God, he gave a window of opportunity. A window of opportunity to do what? Seek. Return. Come. He's given a window of opportunity to seek God. Repent. Follow him. And and listen, I'm so thankful. And you should be too. He sent the Lord Jesus. He sent the Lord Jesus. And, and, And listen, we don't come to God through our own. We come to God through the Lord Jesus. He's the door. And, and, and listen, listen, how were people saved in the Old Testament? By what? Faith. Faith. Abraham was justified by? Faith. How are you saved today? Faith. Listen, in the Old Testament, they were putting their faith in the Messiah to come. They were putting their faith in the Messiah who, who would come, who would live, who would die, who would resurrect, who would ascend. Praise God, we in the New Testament, here in 2022, we put our faith in the Messiah who did come, who did live, who did die, who did resurrect, who did ascend, and we're waiting for him to come again. We, I mean, it's still by faith, ladies and gentlemen, through the Lord Jesus. But listen, there's only a window of opportunity. A, a, A small window of opportunity. Now, just yesterday... As I was studying, I come across some information of a man who died at 109 years old. 109 years old. And and, and I I, I saw him. There's a video of him. I mean, he just looks skeletal. He looks skeletal. He was able to move, but he just recently died. Listen, 109 years to us. That's, he lived a full life. He lived a full life. But let me just tell you, that's a drop in the bucket in regards to eternity. 109 years is still a vapor. Whew. And then it's gone. Listen, I don't know if the man accepted Christ or not. I have no idea. But this is what I do know. As dark as this world is, if he did not know Christ, listen, he's in an even darker judgment. He is. And that's the reality. Church, what do we do? We tell people about the one who came. They might be wondering, lost people might be wondering, is there any light coming? This is what we do. The light came already. The light came. The light lived. The light died. The light resurrected. The light's coming again. We tell them about the light. Because there's only a small window of opportunity. There's only a small chance. Because listen, that window doesn't stay open forever. That window will close. It will. How many of you know who? Oh, Penn Gillette. Anybody know who that is? Penn Gillette. Okay, Penn Gillette. Um, he, he's, a, he's a magician. He, you might know Penn and Teller. I don't know if you are familiar with that. Okay, yeah, Penn and Teller. Uh, Penn Gillette is a very, very loud and devout atheist. Very loud, very proud about it, devout atheist. Listen to what he says. I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. Proselytizes is basically evangelizing. That's what that is. He says, I, so I'm, I'm going to change this quote just so that we're all on the same page here, okay? I, I always said that I don't respect people who don't evangelize. I don't respect that at all. If you, if you believe that there is a heaven and a hell, and people could be going to hell or not get eternal life, and you think it's not really worth telling them because it makes it socially awkward— How much do you have to hate somebody to not evangelize? 
How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and to not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond the shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that the truck was bearing down on you, there is a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. How many of you just got convicted by a quote from an atheist? Yeah. How much do we have to hate somebody to not tell them God gave you a chance to escape the worst judgment of eternity? Listen, we have a small window of opportunity to share the gospel with people. A very small window to receive for them to receive the gospel. And listen, but if they don't repent and don't turn to the Lord Jesus, then the judgment that they will face will be darker than anything that this world can possibly throw at them. For the believer, this is as bad as it gets. There's hope, there's confidence in the Lord Jesus. There's an eternal, everlasting home to be with him forever. But for the lost person who's hurting, for the lost person who contemplates suicide to end this darkness because it's so overwhelming to them, they need to know about the light. They need to know because if they take their own life tonight or tomorrow or wherever, because this life is hard, little do they know that they're only going into a far worse judgment that's unescapable and it lasts for all eternity may we as the people of god be willing to speak up may we as the people of god be willing to be bold and just share the light of the gospel with the lost Amen. yeah father we thank you lord for this night that you've given us